Why do such obviously godly people doubt their salvation? Well, some people think the presence of any sin in their life is a sign that they're still not saved. But 1 John 1, 6 through 8 tells us that true Christians must confess that they still struggle with sin. It says this, This is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we think, okay, we're not supposed to be sinning at all because God is a God of light and there's still darkness in me. But they got to keep reading. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Brother, I still have sin in my heart. I can't dwell with a God of light because there's darkness in me. And it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of son, Jesus, his son Jesus, cleanses us from all sins. And so now someone, like the person I'm describing, is now totally in despair. If we walk in the light. But then John says this, but if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Verse 7 is clearly talking to Christians. But if we, Christians, walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. But verse 8 is also talking to Christians. If we, Christians, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. True Christians still have the remnants of the flesh within them. They still struggle with sin. Why am I prefacing everything about our former life this way before we get into exploring that? I'm exploring that because the before of who we were before Jesus Christ, the remnant of that will still be with us as Christians. We will not be perfect in this life, but we will be different. We will be changed. The, the Greek of this text, by the way, literally means if Christians say that we are not having sin... In other words, if we are not presently, progressively having sin, the truth is not in us. So you as a true Christian presently have sin in you, and this, John says, we must confess. Do you still struggle with sin in your life? Well, congratulations, you just answered that question the way a true Christian would answer that question, with a yes. So true Christians admit that they still struggle with sin. And Paul, by the way, saw himself in this way. Paul saw himself as both saved by the work of Jesus Christ and its sufficient application to his life, while at the same time he was still struggling with sin. Paul speaks about this the same way John does. Paul speaks about this in Philippians 3, 8 through 16. Let's just go through verses 8 through 10 first in Philippians 3. Paul said, Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may be may gain Christ. Now notice this verse 9, what he says, and to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So Paul right away there says, it's not my righteousness, but the righteousness I have received by faith. And then he says, he seeks to gain Christ, to gain his righteousness, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So notice the righteousness that Paul depends on. A righteousness not his own. 
We've said this again and again. When you receive the gifted righteousness by faith that God has for you, it is the righteousness of God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. Whose righteousness does Jesus have? God's righteousness. Whose righteousness does Jesus gift you when you put your faith in him? God's righteousness. How pleased is God in his own righteousness? He is perfectly pleased with his righteousness. How pleased will God be with you if he has gifted you his perfect righteousness? God will be perfectly pleased with you, and he is perfectly pleased with you. So Paul was not looking at his own works. He wasn't dis- despairing about sin and his, the presence of sin in his life. Paul saw himself through the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. That is the lens through which he observed himself. He judged himself by the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. So in light of Christ's sufficient work, did Paul stop caring about good works? Not at all. Was Paul anxious about his salvation when he noticed his imperfections? Again, not at all. Paul did three things in response to his battle with sins. Number one, he confessed his present sins. Number two, he battled against his present sin. And number three, he trusted in the perfect and complete work of Jesus Christ. That's why he wrote in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, the next verses, he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. What's Paul doing here? Paul is agreeing with John who said, if we say we are not having sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So Paul's saying, I still struggle with sin. And yet I have been gifted the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the fact that there's still the remnants of the flesh in me should not cause me to cast doubt on my salvation. So he says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God and Jesus Christ. Then he says, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Notice that Paul did not consider himself to be without sin. That's why he said, not that I have already obtained it. I do not consider it to have made it my own. So Paul clearly agrees with the Apostle John who wrote, if we say we have no sin, if we say we are not having sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So how did Paul respond to his present sin? He confessed it, he battled against it, and he trusted in the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. We must remember these truths before we go back and we do a study of who we once were before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. We must remember these truths or going back and studying what we used to be before Jesus Christ will lead us into despair. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. And if I may paraphrase Paul, he is saying, I'm not expecting perfection in this life, but I am expecting progression. I'm not expecting the absence of sin in my life. So I'm trusting in the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
And then notice how Paul concludes this whole lesson that he gives. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Think what way? Think that we still struggle with sin. We must battle against it. That we must rest in the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. That is a sign of Christian maturity. But what if I haven't arrived at that point? What if I haven't come to that understanding? What if I'm struggling to believe this? Paul adds, he adds this. And if in anything you think otherwise, because he knows there's still going to be those doubting Christians. If anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you also. Brother, you know, the rest of us see your salvation. If you don't see it, God will make it clear to you. And so Paul is saying. So mature people rest in the sufficient work of Jesus Christ, admit to their continual battle against sin, and then they seek to have progress in this life, knowing that they will never arrive at perfection in this life. That's in the life to come. That's not in this life. One last introductory point. So the idea that true Christians will struggle with sin in this life is not like some liberal, easy believe is a message of the modern church. The belief that Christians will still struggle with sin is a very ancient teaching. The church has always taught it. I mean, we already saw that Paul taught it. Augustine taught it in the 5th century. And if I'm allowed to go back to the, to the year 1648, the theologians who drafted the Westminster Confession of Faith also said this about true Christians. The Christians will battle with sin. They said, nevertheless, in, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, nevertheless, true Christians may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of the means of their preservation fall into grievous sins. And one of the verses they cite for that, a proof text is David killed Uriah the Hittite in order to cover up his adultery with Bathsheba. And for a time they may even continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure, not God's wrath, God's displeasure, and grieve his Holy Spirit, and come to be deprived of, their, of some measure of their graces and comfort so that they may struggle to feel the comfort of their salvation because there's still some sin in their life that they just need to get out and confess and have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Not eternal judgment. But my point here is this, that the church has always comforted, its, comforted itself in the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ and has always acknowledged that true Christians will continue to struggle with sin. It's not a new teaching. It's a very old teaching. It's not a liberal easy believism. We're just trying to fill the pews. It's a truth that God has given us for our comfort so that we rightly judge ourselves. So this is the end of a rather odd introduction because they said we're going to go into discussing what we were before Jesus Christ is always faltering. And I preface this message this way because I know that it is easy for us to look at what we used to be and see that the remnants of that old nature still remain in us and then to despair because we have forgotten that we rest in the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ.